today we're going to be finishing up Hebrews chapter 12. And I've titled today's message, The Mounds of Fear and Grace. Now, if you haven't been with us, if you haven't uh, watched any of the messages prior to this, for those watching, um, during uh, the past three studies that we've covered so far here in Hebrews chapter 12, the author has presented to us wisdom for living this Christian life by using the metaphor of a long distance race, or as others may say, a, a marathon. The writer has told us that in order to succeed in this great race, we must carefully, we must carefully uh, apply spiritual athleticism. And here's what I mean by that. For instance, back in verses one, in th one through three, um, he presented the basics. That we must run with perseverance by stripping off every weight that slows us down and the sin that easily trips us up. And instead, focus, keep our focus on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Then in verses 4 to 11, he went on to advise us how to endure the race's hardships, specifically to make the most out of spiritual discipline. And then last week, when we covered verses 12 through 17, he instructed us on what to do to finish the race well. But he also told us what to guard against if we truly desire to make it to the end of the race. Now, one of the facts that comes through loud and clear is that marathoning is tough. It's rough. It's not easy. Just like marathoners go through the physical discomfort of a long race, believers will also go through the spiritual equivalent. And sometimes, again, like marathoners, will be encouraged by those along the way to keep running, to keep going, cheering us, cheering for us, and telling us, pick up those feet. Pick up those feet. Keep going. Don't stop. And they do that. They do that because they know from their own experience that their encouragement that they're giving you will motivate us to finish well. But there's an experience that the spiritual runner goes through, that he undergoes, that it doesn't really happen to those in a physical race. And that's the taunting and criticism of distractors, who don't, those who don't want to see you succeed want to see you disqualify yourself, want you to fall out of the race. This was the experience of those early Hebrew, of that early Hebrew church and virtually all who have subsequently followed in its footsteps. Now in those days when this letter was written, Jewish Christians were being taunted by their family and friends and synagogue leaders for leaving their Jewish faith. They probably heard things like, you're on the wrong path. You're headed away from Sinai and Jerusalem. You've left your cultural heritage in Abraham and the only God and the people, the only people God is blessed. You'll never make it. Well, in the first part of our passage today, we're, the writer will be addressing such thinking. He's going to do this by contrasting where his people have come from and where they've come and to where indeed they're going. He will explain the contrast between Mount Sinai and Zion, the old and new covenants, terror and joy, fear and grace, distance and closeness. Then in the last part of the chapter, 
He will give a stern word of caution, a warning to all of us, to everyone reading this letter, against neglecting the gospel of Christ and refusing to hear God's word. And so today's message, our message today, will do a couple things. First, it's going to show you that if you endure in the faith, you've come to Zion, the mountain of God's new and better covenant mediated through Jesus Christ. And secondly, at the end of the chapter, we're going to see that God has indeed spoken to us in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. If we, like the Israelites, reject his merciful word, we won't escape his coming judgment. And so before we begin reading today, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning through his word and this message. Heavenly Father, we are so, again, thankful that you have us all here. And as I pray every Sunday, Lord, for the past six years, you have a reason and purpose that you have everyone here, even me, Lord. So I pray that you will bless those that are here. They will hear what it is that you want to tell them, what you have to tell them, Lord. And you will do the same for those watching and listening to this message. So I pray you will remind your people, people that have come to know your son, Jesus Christ, the importance of enduring during difficult times in this race, Lord, that you will lead them to the path that leads to Mount Zion. So again, Lord, we ask that you pour your, spil- your spirit upon this place now, Lord, as we sit at your feet and hear your word. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be finishing off this chapter. It's taken us a few weeks. But we'll be picking up in verse 18. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. The word of God says, For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which which says better things than the blood of Abel. In 1986, Texas gem dealer Roy Wettstein was pawing, was pawing through, a, through a Tupperware bowl of cheaply priced rocks at a mineral show in Arizona when he came across a lavender gray potato-sized stone that looked a bit special. You want $15 for this? Weinstein asked the amateur collector. Tell you what, replied the collector. I'll let you have it for 10. It's not as pretty as the others. Wettstein walked away with the world's largest star sapphire, later valued as high as $2.28 million. He planned to sell his 1900 1900, uh, carat bargain in its 
in its uncut form for 1.5 million and put the profits in trust in a trust for his two sons each of whom he had given had given dad $5 to bring back a little something from the gem show if you don't know what you possess ladies and gentlemen you may disregard it or let it go for something worth far less Esau did that read about that last week he didn't appreciate the value of his birthright which entitled him to the blessings of God of God's promises to Abraham and so he traded it for a bowl of soup he gave away eternal blessings for instant gratification so as you can see it was a bad trade but that's what the original readers of uh, this letter, the, Hebrew, the Jewish Christians, were in danger of doing. Under the threat of persecution, they were tempted to abandon Christ and return to their Jewish faith, their Jewish religious customs. So the author here contrasts the terrors of Mount Sinai, representing Jewish life under the law, with the glories of Mount Zion, picturing the joy of life under the new covenant. He wants us to know that right living flows out of right knowing. If you know the riches that you possess in Christ, you won't want to go back to the empty, fleeting pleasures of the world. Now, in verse 25 here, I'm sorry, in verse 18, he begins with the word for. There the, the writer wants us, as the reader, to do a couple things. First, he wants us to look back at what he just finished saying in verses 12 through 17. This section, therefore, provides the reason why Christians can strengthen their tired hands and weaken the knees and make straight paths for their feet. As a believer, as a born-again Christian, you can do these things because you haven't come to Sinai. Nope. You've come to a better mountain, Mount Zion. However, in order to understand Zion, we must first understand what uh, he's saying about what he's about to say uh, regarding Sinai, which is the other purpose for using the word for. And so by using that word, he wants us again to look backward, this time all the way back to the Old Testament. The phrase, not come to what could be touched, it directs us back to Exodus chapter 19. The origin of the law on Mount Sinai. Now for those who may not know or aren't familiar with that story, Mount Sinai was a mountain Moses climbed to receive the Ten Commandments. God's law on behalf of Israel. Well there in Exodus 19, the Lord commanded Moses to warn the people of Israel not to go up to the mountain or to touch it or they die. They couldn't touch the mountain because God's presence consecrated the place and set it apart from the sinful people. That mountain instantly became holy and pure and nothing unpure or unholy, sinful, could touch that mountain. If an uninvited sinner touched it, touched that mountain when God was present, he or she would be put to death. Now, when the Lord was present on the mountain, it was consumed by thick smoke, earthquakes, thunder, and lightning. It was wrapped in smoke and trembled greatly 
because the Lord had descended on it with fire, in fire. Furthermore, the mountain resounded with a very loud trumpet blast, one that grew louder and louder with every blow. All of this demonstrated the presence of God on the mountain. It represented his incomparable power, might, and sheer holiness. Thus, this mountain was a place of awe and terror. Awe and terror for Israel because they trembled in fear as they stood before it. This was the place that the people of Israel had come. Verses 19 and 20 continues expressing the terror related to the encounter and its effects on the people. It says in Exodus 20 that when the Lord spoke, spoke from the midst of the smoke covering that mountain, the people begged Moses to speak uh, to them instead. He didn't want God to speak to them. He wanted Moses, Moses to be that representative, that mediator. And as Exodus chapter 19 says, the congregation was even commanded to stone to death any animal, anything, even an animal that touched the mountain. So when the author emphasized that command in verse 20, it demonstrated, it basically demonstrated what the cost was of being unclean in the midst of God's holy presence. Then in verse 21, the writer ends by pointing out that even that mediator, even the mediator that the people wanted to be, to, they wanted God to speak uh, through him, they wanted, the people wanted Moses to speak to them instead of God. That mediator was, Moses was trembling with fear. Now he, again, he did this, the writer did this to show us how incomprehensibly terrifying God's presence on Sinai. Again, I'll get to it, but that represents, the Sinai represents the old covenant, the law, how, uh, his presence, how uh, terrifying his presence was, and how it became a place of just sheer dread. It was terrifying. So although that trip to Sinai allowed the people to see God's holiness and their sinfulness, the pro there was a big problem still. The law didn't provide any power to overcome sin. This is why the writer's explanation that they've come to a better mountain than Sinai makes sense. You haven't come to a mountain that can be touched. The place they came to was Zion, which is a spiritual mountain, whereas Zion was a physical mountain that caused pain and death when it was touched. And so basically, the writer is admonishing his people who are attempting to run their race with perseverance to not listen to those who were still trying to live up to Sinai, but rather do everything they can to maintain a straight path to Zion's grace. I don't know if any of you have read, have read that book, um, a pilgrim's process or pilgrim's progress. Well, in the beginning of that book, there's a part where the character, the, one of the main characters, Christian, was having difficulties trying to walk the narrow path to Zion, but is lured away by Mr. Worldly Wiseman's counsel and directed towards the futility of Sinai. And so Bunyan writes, And this is a quote from the book. So Christian turned out of his way to go to Mr. Legality's house for help. But behold, when he got by the hill, 
it seemed so high. There came also flashes of fire out of the hill that made Christian afraid that he should be burnt. Here, therefore, he sweat and did quake for fear. And now he began to be sorry that he had taken Mr. Worley Wiseman's counsel. And with that, he saw Evangelist coming to him at the sight of who also of whom he began to blush for shame. And of course, Mr. Evangelist got him back on the right track and the race continued on to Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. If you're a believer here today, or you're watching, it's going to be a lot of voices out there We're going to try to lure you away from Zion by convincing you or manipulating you that Sinai is much better. But don't let them fool you. Don't fall for it. We just finished reading that that's not the place that you've come to. All they're really trying to do is hinder your spiritual marathon by convincing you that you have to run up that steep mountain of Sinai. That mountain, folks, is nothing more than religious legalism that will make coming directly to or or coming directly to meet God a terrifying or burdensome place. But that's not where Christians meet God in the new covenant. And that's the point the author is trying to make. He paints this terrifying picture of Sinai for for us, the readers, in order to make the contrast with a radiant, glorious, and gracious new covenant. The awful terror of Sinai which isn't the mount which we've come, shows the radical mercy of Zion. There at Zion, God embraces us with his grace and administers to us a covenant where he doesn't merely write the law on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of our hearts. As Zion is is Jesus Christ, our mediator, our sinless high priest, who offered himself as a sacrifice so that we can directly meet with God with clean and purified hearts. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So if you've arrived at Zion, and it's the place where you're supposed to be, why would you want to go back to Sinai? It doesn't make sense. Well, after describing the place that we've left, the author goes on to show in verses 21 through 24, seven spectacular places that we've come to. First of all, it says there that we've come to the city of the living God. Mount Zion was was a location that David captured and made a religious center, the religious center of his kingdom by bringing the Ark of the Covenant of God. He brought it there. And when his son Solomon built the temple and installed the Ark, Zion slash Jerusalem became synonymous with the earthly dwelling place of God. Well, as Christians, as born-again believers, we're now citizens of the heavenly city and enjoy its privileges. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from them, from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, as a people, as Christians, and as a church, 
we meet myriads of angels in a festive gathering. Now, the word myriad here, it doesn't just mean a handful of angels, but rather, as Daniel says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, 10 thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They're everywhere. Mighty flame, mighty flaming spirits, who according to chapter 1 of this letter, chapter 1, verse 14, are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. So let me, again, just clarify. As a believer, as a Christian, you've come to a myriad of angels that are partying up in heaven. These angels are more than you can imagine, more than you can number. And they're passing in and out of your life, moving around you and over you. And they're here to serve those who will inherit salvation. But the main emphasis here isn't so much on the angels' care for us, but rather our joining them in a festive gathering. Whereas Mount Sinai, the angels blew celestial trumpets that terrified God's people we're to see ourselves on Mount Zion, worshiping in awe by side, uh, worshiping in awe side by side with the shining, divine, beautiful beings. Third, we come to fellow believers, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven. Now, yes, Jesus, of course, is the firstborn. But by virtue of our union with him, we've now also become firstborn. This includes all the rights of inheritance as the firstborn. To us who are co-heirs, co-heirs with Christ. But that's not all. There's more. As firstborns, our names are written in heaven along with the firstborn who's already there. In, in other words, every believer that's alive right now, they share an eternal bond with every believer who's in heaven. We share a bond with Jesus Christ who is sitting at the right hand of God. All, again, all believers that lived in, all those believers in the early Christian church, all those, you know, great church fathers and, and people who wrote great theological books and, you know, who died at the arenas and we share a bond with them. We're all, all of us, we're the body of Christ. Fourth, we come to God, to a judge who is God of all. Now, although the scene in Zion, uh, the, although the scene in Zion is that we come to a joyous festival, it isn't just a casual thing. We come to Zion to meet the God of Sinai, who is judge of all. Sometimes it's hard for us to do when we think of God. We, we don't think of God as judge, as a righteous judge, not as a corrupt judge that you see, that maybe you see on TV or that you've heard of, but a righteous and holy judge. Back in 
again, this letter, chapter 4, verse 13, it says that no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. There's nothing you can hide from God. When he judges you, he's going to see every single thing, every thing that you thought, everything that was in your heart, everything that you did, you won't be able to hide from it. Or you won't be able to hide uh, that sin from him. He will know it and will call you out on it. Expose it. And also, back in chapter 10, verses 30 and 31, the writers also said this. Vengeance, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Knowing this then, we come before him in awe because he is judge. But we don't come in guilty. We don't come as believers, as Christians, we don't come before his throne room as guilty sinners. No, we don't. You know why? Because his son became the judgment for us. So church, to gather before God is a miracle of grace. And it should be our highest delight. Now fifth, we come to the church, to the church triumphant, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect. As I said before, even though all these former Christians, these former, well, these believers are in heaven, we share a solidarity with those who have gone before. The same spiritual life courses through us as it did through them. But what's absolutely amazing is that they died thousands of years before us. But God planned, according to chapter 11, verse 30, that they would not be made perfect without us. So you see, they waited and waited and waited, and many of them for centuries, for the perfection you received when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Sixth, we come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. At Sinai, Moses was a mediator of the old covenant. But as great as he was, we're told that even there on the mountain, he trembled with fear. But through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, we draw near with confidence. He is the source and dispenser of everything we hope for. He is in you, and you're in him. And finally, seventh, we come to forgiveness because of sprinkled blood. To the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. Abel's warm blood cried from the ground for vengeance and judgment. But Christ's blood shouts that we're forgiven and have peace with God. The blood of Christ, however, accomplished what the animal sacrifices couldn't. His blood is sufficient to forgive sin and to save us from the judgment sin deserves. Therefore, Jesus is the mediator of a new and better covenant. By this sacrifice, 
and his sacrifice alone, we come to Zion and to the sprinkled blood that says better things than the blood of Abel. It says better things because the blood of Jesus saves. It completely washes away our sin and, satisf and satisfies God's wrath once and for all. Meaning you don't have to keep doing it over and over and over again. It completely, completely washes away sin. Once and for all. Those were the seven. And so just to go over these again, in case you missed it, as a born again believer, you have come right now at this very instance to these seven, to these seven amazing realities. To the city of God, to the myriad of angels, to fellow believers, to God, to the church triumphant, to Jesus, to forgiveness. Well, now that you know these things, I have to ask this question. Where are you living? Are you living on Mount Sinai, trying to earn acceptance with the holy God by keeping his law? If so, you should be scared. Because you, it's impossible. You won't be able to meet the demands of his holiness. But, but my friends, if you've placed your trust in Jesus Christ, you're living on Mount Zion. And if that's you, let me give you two quick applications from this passage. First, stay focused on what Christ has done for you. Keep your eyes on that. In a similar context where Paul was warning about the dangers of legalism, he wrote this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Friends, my fellow believer, my brother and sister in Christ, that's where all our treasure, all our treasures lie. Don't forget it. Keep seeking implies a lifelong quest. If you lose sight of the benefits of Zion, you may be tempted like Esau to trade your treasures in Christ for the world's empty pleasures. And second, Maintain the biblical balance between familiar fellowship with the Father and the reverence, the reverential awe of His holiness. Back in chapter 4, verse 16, the writer said, We're to approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. But we also need to remember what he also said in here in verse 29 of this chapter. Our God is a consuming fire. Yes, our God is a consuming fire. Now moving on, as we move on now to the last part of this passage, there are certain passages in the Bible that are particularly vivid either in promise, judgment, or warning. Well, here in this last section that we're about to read is one of those vivid passages because of the stern word of caution that will be given. So let's pick up there where we left off in verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See to it that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they rejected him, who warned them on earth, even less 
will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? His voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, indicates the removal of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what is not shaken might remain. Therefore, since we're, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we may serve God accept, uh, acceptably with reverence and awe. Again, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. In this last section of chapter 12, um, the writer, again, is contrasting God's revelation at Sinai with his revelation in and through Christ. The incomparable privileges and glories of the Christian faith they're not to be treated lightly. See, when God is speaking, he's inviting. He's inviting or wooing someone. But as verse 25 says, to reject the one who speaks is to perish. Friends, God is speaking to us today through his word, through every word that's in this book and his providential workings in the world. So we better listen. We better pay attention to what he's saying. If God shook things at Sinai and those who refused to hear were judged, how much more responsible are we who've experienced the blessings of the new covenant at this very moment? Now, the shaking quotation mentioned in verse 26 is from the Old Testament book of Haggai, there in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 6. And it refers to that time when the Lord will return and fill his house with glory. If you think about it, at this very moment, God is shaking things. If you don't think so, watch the news. Do you know that they just recently found polio in New York? Man, it's crazy. You know, we hear about, we know about these wars going on in Eastern Europe and rumors of war there in the Pacific. There's so much greed, so much disobedience, so much anger, so much hate here. There's a quasi-civil war going on in our, our own country where you have people on the right fighting the people on the left. You have people that are from one political party trying to destroy another political party. If you mention certain words, you'll get canceled. And again, there's just so much hatred and tolerance too by those who say they're conservative, those who say they're Christian for those who don't know Christ and are living a sinful lifestyle. Again, just so much going on. These and other things should tell you, should show you that God is shaking things up right now. And your spiritual antennas should be rising. I really believe that he's tearing down the scaffolding and showing us the unshakable realities that are eternal. 
But sadly, what I also see is too many, Christ- too many people, including Christians, building their lives on things that can be shaken. And so as the events draw near to that time, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more shaking with a lot more intensity. But if you're sitting here today, if you're watching, you can be confident. You can be confident for you shall receive an unshakable kingdom. As a matter of fact, you're actually part of God's kingdom today. If indeed you've given your life, you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. So in the meantime, until that happens, what should we do as we live in a shaking world? Well, the answer is simple. It's not that hard. Listen to God speak and obey him. Receive grace day by day to serve him with reverence and godly fear. Don't be distracted or frightened by the tremendous changes going on around you. Also, keep running the race with endurance and keep looking to Jesus Christ. Remember that your father loves you and draw on God's enabling grace. While others are being frightened, while others are too scared to venture out of their own homes, you, as a Christian, as a believer, you can be confident. Finally, brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't want to overlook that last warning given to us in verse 29. Our God is a consuming fire. As believers, we must serve him with reverence and godly fear. Why? Because like an actual fire, a real intense fire, God indeed will consume anything which distracts you from your relationship and your dependency on him. He's going to burn it up. But here's the thing. If you're at the place, if you're at a place right now where you're experiencing the fire of God, again, fear not. Don't dread it. Don't be scared of it. Don't be scared because as it burns, the warmth and brightness of his love will indeed burn away all that is unfruitful and that is distracting your walk with him. This should also bring comfort to you as a believer because a father poured out his consuming fire of judgment, not on you. He didn't pour it out on you. He poured it out on his son instead of us. When he did, it completely consumed the guilt of sin in all of us. When the penalty of sin was consumed in Jesus at the cross. Uh, The gospel is Christ's abundant mercy, saving us from the holy wrath we rightfully deserve. And so by remembering that God is a consuming fire, it ought to stoke our reverence and our awe of him. It ought to remind us of the severe and eternal consequences of failing to turn to him in faith and repentance. And so now let me close by saying this. We, members of the unshakable kingdom are meant to worship with thankful thankful hearts. Our pulses should race with thanksgiving. Thanks be to God 
in his indescribable gift. For his indescribable gift. As Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says, whatever we do or wherever we go, we must be always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now believe me, I know how easy it is to succumb to focusing on one mountain at the expense of another. But theological balance is the key here. When you balance this out, it will help you to understand that our God is both unapproachable and approachable. Lastly, the, the twin peaks of our spiritual life demand two things as we march to Zion. Obedience and worship. Let us obey his word implicitly for it is effectual. It never fails and it is final. It will shake the entire universe. So let us worship him with reverence and awe and thanksgiving. I want to take a moment now to speak to those watching and listening who have heard this message and you realize now that you want to come, you want to be at Mount Zion. You lived your entire life there in Mount Sinai. And approaching God seems like a terrifying and dreadful thing. You've been told that you've got to do a hundred things, two hundred things, all kinds of things in order to find that peace with God. We get that peace with God. Well, let me tell you, you don't have to be there on that mountain. You can go directly to Zion, to Mount Zion, where you will find peace, forgiveness, and God's grace. So if you're ready and you want to come to that mountain so that you may receive forgiveness, then I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with all sincerity. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe now that truly you died for my sins. And I believe by faith again that you rose from the dead. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. And I now confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. And I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me for the rest of my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you pray that, I want you to reach out to us. Not us. Reach out to that Christian, that believer that you used to make fun of and that you used to mock and, and, and laugh at and let him know, man, he wants, to, he wants to celebrate with you. He wants to, you know, he's going to be so happy for you. Thank you for joining us today.
again, if you have any questions or have any comments, please feel free to share them, reach out to us. Um, if you're here locally in El Paso, uh, we want to invite you to come check out our church here in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. We'd love to meet you and, and, and talk to you and pray with you. You have a great Sunday. Have a great week. And we hope to see you soon. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.